Schultz's poetic prose was the reading of my early youth. It influenced my films. That is why the realization of the hourglass sanatorium was a must for me. My aim was not to make a literal adaptation of the work, but rather to do justice to what we call the work's poetics, its unique, isolated world, its atmospheres, colors, and shapes. That is Wojciech Huss, talking about a 1937 novel by Polish author Bruno Schultz. For Huss, Sanatorium Under the Sign of the Hourglass would become, for him, the Hourglass Sanatorium, a tripnotic, hypnotic, and yes, totally psychedelic descent through the distorted fantasies of Joseph, attending to his unwell father in a rather, well, unsanitary sanatorium. But is it a dream or a nightmare? To answer that question as ever is Ralph Pritchard, for whom the hourglass is one of his all-time faves, apparently. Ralph, feeling sleepy or are you awake? Yeah, so this film is one of my favorite films of all time, and I've seen it countless times, maybe six or seven. Um, That's not countless, is it? Well, I just tried to count it, but the, the vagaries <laughs> of my the, the number of times I've seen it <laughs> indicate the countlessness of it. Right, right, right. To bring in another quote from Project Has, like... Um, he was reported by one of his students at the Lodge Film School and the, the student had made a film with a dream sequence in it mm. and Project Has was very clear um, you will not um, in a film that is overseen by me there will be no dream sequences because the entirety <laughs> of film is a dream like the experience of film is, is, is the dream world what a rascal absolutely amazing I mean it's sort of like a classic case of someone being like uh, misinterpreted by a noob um, because obviously his work is like very dreamlike but there's never a moment where someone like falls asleep and like you know the harp glistens Um, but Mm, yeah there's no wobble of the screen it's all yeah one of my favourite things about this film is that it evokes childhood without Mm. um, uh, it, it, it manages to tap into kind of an irrational world a mythic world without using obtrusive devices it flows in a very agile way it's mm. all it's like this the way it evokes like sexuality and memory and yeah it, it, it also just talks about the holocaust in a way that one that makes sense from the perspective of a child who doesn't quite know what's going on yeah the the this kind of chaotic um powering unknown that kind of hovers at the edge of the film right because mm. there's no point it was very easy to watch this film in a way because you kind of release yourself into its dream state because it's not like you said there's no like we are entering a dream mm. from moment one frame one this is not ordinary um you know it's everything has kind of got this rotten decay over it which is you know it's a signifier of a kind of uh ruined faded world and you know the 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 film begins on a train he's on a train to go and visit his father at a sanatorium it's it's not like when he enters the sanatorium it's like he's gone into the secret garden or through the closet into narnia it's like it was already that um Mm. you know it's this kind of harrowed express like you know it's like a a, a beckman painting it's like these kind of tortured strange bodies ghoulish there's cobwebs on everyone's faces there's moaning and groaning it's all very kind of composed um but yeah like from scene one it's just already freaky um which is interesting and it, it, yeah it does make it it, it it more profound because yeah you, it's not like you slip into the dream everything is oneric everything is uh, mm. uh, you know bizarre even though it, it's got lots of levels to it like the best dreams you know he's constantly climbing through he, he goes under a bed uh, he climbs up a ladder um, he climbs, gets shunted over a wall so there's different areas of, the, of this like mind palace is probably a better way to put it so mm. that the sanatorium itself kind of falls away um pretty quickly and it's like it's yeah it feels quite natural you know i was surprised actually when um because i you, you've described this film soon before i've this was my first viewing um mm. and yeah I was, I was expecting something different actually i was expecting it to be less um considering you were really anti um our argentinian friend um from chilean. a couple of weeks ago <laughs> chilean fuck it sorry chilean friend <clears throat> um there are interesting Hodorowsky. uh Hodorowsky, yeah there are interesting um parallels between the cinema of Hodorowsky and Haas 
um, mm. in terms of its staging and its use of props and so on. And it, it's kind of, and all, all of Jodorowsky's film, like from scene one to scene, final scene, it's all weird. There's no like normal and weird bit. Um, so I was surprised actually that your, your uh, dislike of Jodorowsky yeah, you're like Hourglass Sanatorium. So for you, what's the what's the difference? What you know, what's the proof in the pudding? So I think with Jodorowsky, there's this there's this very self conscious use of metaphor, which is um, which is and and a presentational style that I find found quite narcissistic, and um, and also maybe there's a certain taste thing where I just found the the look of it like not uh, not mm. um not nice i also think that some of the fabrications of shop fronts and stuff the kind of way that certain bits of it was so some of it was the ways in which some of it was staged felt um artificial i guess in regards to how that compares with hourglass sanatorium the hourglass sanatorium manages to within one location basically manages to um, bring in loads of of different worlds, and there is this continuum, this uh, this this flowing that is very much like a dream and doesn't ever comment on itself being like being a dream. It just mm. presents in a dreamlike way. Um, it invites you to uh, to it invites you into the logic of its world without ever like telling you what that world is. I think that is important. I think also, yeah, like the um, the performance, the central performance of the main character, uh, Jan Nowicki, who is who's quite a um, he's in a couple other films, significance like uh, the third part of the night by Zhorovsky, which is a great film. Mm. Um, but Jan Nowicki, great Polish actor, mm. plays the main character Joseph, and um, he has this amazing ability to be our representative as the viewer there's a there's a, there's a an element of what's going on here but also mm. a total willingness to go along for the ride <laughs> yeah. and that is it's, it's, it's very few actors who manage to kind of do that and it, you need something like that to to make that world work i get you yeah, get a bit in twin peaks i think dale cooper carl, carl mclaughlin's character in that um has this has that same quality of like bringing you know being like just sort of just about normal enough to like have that identifiable yeah, he, difference like oh what's going on here credulous enough yeah, yeah exactly yeah exactly. with 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 you know with with joseph and this with jan the character yeah he goes from a kind of rabbit in the headlights stunned deer but in a similar in similar vein actually uh to the trial he kind of yeah and, uh, slips into the world and becomes a kind of uh, master of ceremonies of it almost like he mm. um, you know even though that there's obviously like a, a it's like a clockwork animation that's ticking into place um, and he kind of performs and, and and kind of participates in its absurdities you know the fact that he dons that fireman's helmet and wears it for much mm. of the film um, is an interesting prop because it kind of rather than being just in his suit which would kind of signify him being a kind of out forever outsider you know he's kind of playing in it and a lot of the film rests on conversations about hard to follow conversations perhaps but conversations on on uh, the written language and a kind of uh a belief in the written written scripture and documents so the idea of a book a central book a central mythology or narrative is really important to it um he collects the pages of this he calls it the an original book um he collects the pages of this and gathers them together and is very protective over it even though other people kind of say oh it's just receipts and adverts and we use them to wrap meat and sandwiches um <laughs> but he's very protective over it other conversations you know uh, when he's talking to Rudolf, uh, the little boy, um, which I kind of took maybe as a cipher for him or his childhood or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, he, when um, he's talking to Rudolf, he definitely is similar to Rudolf's age in that moment. Um, mm. I feel yeah, like they're kind of, in the same way that when he's talking to the sexy woman, um, the, the redheads. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're like sort of town whore. Um, he's <laughs> like, I think so. he's kind of like pubescent at that moment, I imagine. Because mm. she I says, oh, a- "If only you were older. If only exactly, you were yeah. born earlier." And his mum says the same. His mum's like, "You must go to school, Joseph." 
Yeah, like he's, he's like, old enough to get a boner, but he's not. Yeah, so in, in, in the film, there's kind of a real world here, which is the world of his childhood. There's this largely Jewish community somewhere in Poland. The kind of, like you said, the village hall, his father is a, or was a, um, store holder, a store owner. So we, we see him in his shop and there's those scenes and there's like a village square and it kind of flips between those and this kind of grotty country house that's fallen into decay, this marshland. So there's like, there's a kind of familiar geography to it, but it's populated with like the fantastical, the, the frontier coming home, right? Because there's, um, black uh soldiers but dressed in napoleonic uniforms um you know they're like the toy soldiers of a child um mm. beating drums there's all these kind of grand priests and generals and uh lords dressed up on horses so they're, they're the figurines almost of a, of a child's imagination and when he talks mm. to rudolph he, rudolph has his book of stamps and um there's this kind of tension between them in a way where you know uh uh, Joseph is kind of like fabricating this fantastical story about an em- emperor and a uh, revolution in his head. Um, and that plays out through his world. So he, yeah, he's very much the master of ceremonies, the conductor of this world. Um, and, and whether what we're supposed to do with that narratively, I don't think much like, cause it's, yeah, he's gone to see it. Technically he's the narrative. He's gone to see his, his papa in a sanatorium. His, mm. his, da- his place is weird. Um, and his dad is dead. But the doc, the way the book doctor puts it is like he's like we've suspended time in this place, um, so he's dead, but he does not know it yet. Um, and yeah, then, he gets, so he gets to spend time with his dad, you know, yeah, which is nice. Which is interesting. Yeah, it's almost like but his this, dad is this behaving is, quite strangely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, his dad is um, this this insane bird collector almost isn't he he's he's always surrounded by birds he's he's got this kind of he becomes more alive as the film goes on actually at the beginning he's literally laid out in state not moving Mm. and by the end he's kind of dancing and chirping and um leading the people around himself Mm. right while Um, his son is kind of becoming more and more i mean a spoiler alert but like mm. the end moment it's a very sad ending but it's like a kind of sadness that's quite hard to kind of explain because it's so poetic, the the move mm. towards the end, where um, Joseph is basically um, dressed uh, to be like the train conductor at the start of the film, the blind train conductor. He's mm. he's essentially sort of like um, that role is conferred conferred on him, and so he he goes into mm. a sort of death, a kind of haunt, a kind of zombie state. Um, carrying the, this this candle and on his around his neck, and stepping mm. out onto this field of um, of of, of cat burning candles and graves, yeah, and great and graves, an image one can only one cannot separate from the Holocaust or the the, the, no. the feeling of the Holocaust. Um, but yeah, through that process, you have this the central emotional feeling is like the father who's like it's gonna be all right like our shop might be shutting down but like we'll start a new shop or things will get better and then the son being like i don't know what's going on Mm. um but i something strange is happening and like what sort of starts off as a playful child's game becomes this really haunting trauma that unfolds quite slowly and meanwhile this guy is also in his adult self reconciling himself with this huge grief of his father dying. Mm. And that grief becomes beautifully elided with the grief of a whole community because they are in the ghettos. Mm. You know, this yeah. is about the Jewish ghettos in Poland. Yeah, because it, you're right. It, it, it c- conflates in a really powerful way, a collective agony and trauma and the, which is hard to understand, you know, it's hard to in, in these things it's hard to understand engage even as a participant as it were someone a victim mm. um even harder for a child perhaps and so yeah he's he's mourning for his dad he's mourning for his people um and you know it it, it requires a kind of child's mind as it were to to invade that past and to not come to terms with it because this isn't saying everything's okay it's it's kind of just accepting the um the 
I guess to the trauma and the insanity of it, right? And unlike any and any repressed experience, you know, it is accessed through dreams and through shattered recall, which is kind of what we get here. And like, yeah, like you said, you know, it's interesting. He becomes a conductor because a conductor is kind of like a like Sharon is like the, the 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 boatman of the river of the dead you know he's there to kind of bear witness and to ferry people back and forth into this place um mm. and that's the role he's got to take so it's almost like maybe the filmmaker's role is to like convey this 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 fragmented difficult story um to you the viewer and to future people and i mean it's interesting because um his has was Jewish and his family were Jewish, but they were Roman practicing Roman Catholics. Um, mm. And he was he was agnostic um, personally, um, apparently. Um, but I think, you know, to what extent that was because even you know World World War Two in Poland, obviously the Jewish community was decimated in Poland. Um, and even after under Soviet occupation, like being Jewish was was not necessarily a kind of easy thing to be. Um, particularly under Stalin, things were probably different, a lot different in the seventies. But um, but yeah, it was not. But yeah, easy. he's definitely. What I think is quite beautiful is that it's like in no way an identitarian work. No, you know, like, and I think you could probably, as a gentile, you probably could could have made it. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't feel like. Mm. Um, it doesn't feel like kind of weighed down by like a specif- that specificity, and yet. No. It, it relies on that specificity to have um you know to, to be a story and, and to convey um mm. because there's a history there um when i first saw the film i was quite young when i first saw the film i think i was maybe 14 or 15 oh, wow. and i didn't um i didn't clock that it was about the holocaust at all actually i just sort of thought it was a zany polish film and i just enjoyed mm. every minute of it for the for the joy that it is you know all the colors and the music and the sounds um and then i um yeah i watched it with a friend uh, who taught who was like kind of pointing yes it's doing my jews here jews there you know <laughs> it obviously <laughs> became obvious obviously you know? Yeah. Um, um but um but yeah it's sort of it it manages to transcend that context and be so many things all at once without ever, you know a no no one reading of it really denies any of the others no and like yeah it's, at times it's purely a farcical celebration of a child's imagination um yeah exactly you know and and it, you, it exports you to that world and it, it has an element of terry gilliam in it um his uh time traveling film whose name i cannot for the fucking life of me remember time bandits um, time bandits yeah time bandits so it's got it's got a kind of time bandit quality about it but was suffused with this like ambient trauma um but yeah it, it, all of these things operate there's no correct meaning reading um that stuff is just there uh, I mean, almost it's, anything it's, you compare it to, I think it's better than. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. I mean, Time Bandits or, or this this masterpiece of Polish cinema. I mean, it's hardly. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's but, but yeah, it's, because it's not well known. This film, like, it's really surprising. No. I mean, it was it was um, Mr. Bongo Films, the the UK distributor, kind of made a point of dis- of distributing it in the UK on DVD and Blu-ray about ten ten mm. or so years ago, bringing it to um, fifteen years ago probably bringing it to prominence for western audiences but like it's and martin scorsese did a restoration of it for his kind of mm. you know one of his charitable film archive projects um yeah. but like it's not you know like this film is as good as eight and a half you know like i just don't really know why it's not like oh there huge. is very much that i think i think it's it's less individualistic though than eight and a half and mm. i think one of the reasons eight and a half and maybe jodorowsky as well the, the thing that links eight and a half and jodorowsky cinema and separates it from this cinema because they're all about kind of dreamlike phantasmagoric scenarios mm. is that they're both about you know like you, the reason you dislike jodorowsky is because you know it's all about is it's Narcissist. all about jodorowsky the art the art the artist narcissist yeah I mean, mm. eight and a half is the same you know it's about yeah it is uh, true. fellini's own artistic struggles and it's very much about the tortured artist here joseph is a bit of a cipher he's a blank um mm. almost even though he carries conveys the role brilliantly but we, we don't understand his motivation yeah. um we don't uh, it's it's 
we don't understand that he, what this project is about. Whereas with Jodorowsky and Fellini, we can say, ah, oh, yes, this is an absurd film about the struggles of the artist. And obviously that plays mm. really well to like the BFI crowd um, <laughs> because everyone's like, oh, yes, yes, I'm a, too, I'm a struggling artist. This, this is like me. <laughs> um, whereas here, you can't really say I'm like this. You've got to connect with it on a more... Uh, juvenile and I don't mean that in a pejorative way juvenile mm, way which yeah, is yeah. like yeah this as when you're a child like this is how you see the world and this is how you process really complicated stuff mm. and this is what the world seems like this kind of bizarre where your 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 inner world like uh, you know me and Ralph both I, I I mean I wasn't a participant in Ralph's childhood but I you know imagine you and I both had very kind of rich inner worlds as children and that's you know yes for that, sure that kind of rubs up against the confusing world of adulthood which you kind of want to be part of as well you want to get um but you've got this imaginarium in your head and then this this confusing complex world as well on the outside so it's full of like overlapping contradictory desires and misunderstandings and this is what happens because when rudolph is talking to joseph he's like you're babbling you're incoherent your words are full of <laughs> sighs and repetitions and disorder you know he's got this really brilliant speech um and it's it's great because it is yeah it's almost like almost like you know him him kind of frolicking around with his younger self um yeah it's just it's really exciting in that way to kind of see that blossoming in it not to be not to seem like an individualistic narcissistic exercise um because yeah i i mean i don't know enough about Haas's life and i have not seen any other Haas films i presume uh i presume you have um, yeah, I've seen quite a few of them. Okay, cool. Um, well, how does it relate? How does it like link up with other Haas um, films? Is this a bit of a unique one-off? Or there are kind of two types of Haas film. I think it's fair to say he was a director that did, you know, like a lot of the directors of the Soviet or the the communist era. And I think also like that it's. I'd like to talk a bit later or just in a, in another pod maybe about like how uh, Soviet associated countries deal differently with the individual in relationship to storytelling because mm. i think it, that is as you identified like in relationship to fellini and, and other in Tarkovsky, that's a really crucial distinction but um how's this work yeah he 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 has certain genre styles so there's a film he did called how to be loved which is um a kind of world war Two film about uh, so an actor who hides a dissident in her flat and then is kind of romantically rejected by him um <laughs> and uh that is like a psychological thriller not a thriller but it's like a psychological drama mm. um with a historical context and it's quite it's it it has kind of clear limits to it Whereas he did a film called Lalka the Doll, which is an immense, like, swerving, kind of flowing, um, fant fantastical drama that goes through many different spaces and worlds. Um, possibly his most ambitious film was the Saragossa Manuscript, which is basically like Inception, but with, like... <laughs> folk tales it's like someone will t someone will be like having a duel with someone and then they'll like be like i you know before i before i defeat you i must tell you this story and then it will go into a story and then within that story someone else will tell the story and it kind of it's mm -hmm. like three hours and it just goes between all these Oof. stories it's it's really like astonishing i've only seen it twice but it, it is like one of my faves um so i guess in the uk the two films by him that have been widely distributed uh, relatively widely distributed have been Saragossa Manuscripts and the Hourglass Sanatorium. Mm. But um, yeah, there's a really early film called The Noose, which is just about an alcoholic, and that's another yeah. sort of psychological drama. Um, Saw a couple of uh, flick like seconds of that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's early. really good. Really sincere, mm. really simple, but very different from the Hourglass Sanatorium. I mean, it's not, he had this fantastical dream. Like, I think all of his films have a slight dream like quality, but mm. he definitely reigns it in for those more kind of uh, more genre-ish like sort of drama mm. pieces I mean it, it's interesting I was when we were chatting about it on like WhatsApp I sent you a book it really reminded me of um, talking about kind of similarities and differences mm. between other people and like you are saying about storytelling it was a book by Victoria Foriv, um who was Russian 
uh, writer and actually Aforiev's book uh, Moskva Petushki so Moscow Stations Moscow to Petushki is um, was released in 1973 or I say it was it was published in Samizdat format so it was uh, circulated in kind of home printed as it were editions and handwritten editions um, because it wasn't allowed to be published because it was considered too bohemian and too reactionary um, uh, because it was it was about dreams and it was dreamlike and, and interestingly Fourier's book takes place on a, entirely on a train it's a train journey as a man goes to visit his daughter similar mechanic um, but absolutely no question that they, they probably didn't know of know of each other's existence um, and in that film it, this alcoholic character kind of just basically gets delirium tremens he just drinks himself into this this kind of chaotic brilliant stupor um to the point where he misses the stop of just to see his daughter and then falls asleep and is chased and haunted by these demons back to moscow um and it's a really interesting kind of psychedelic uh kind of outsider element to both of these things like one a book one a, a film um and there's a kind of yeah, there's a kind of undercurrent of like the seven early seventies in Russia, like the the sixty eight kind of percolating and and kind of the uh, the counterculture of Western Europe and America kind of percolating through Eastern Europe a little bit um, in little interesting ways. And I think both of these films reflect that. Even even the choice of font actually uh, for the <laughs> titles has got this very like. Uh, psychedelic acid drippy quality to it hasn't it <clears throat> so it's yeah. p- playing in that it's, they're kind of par- participating in that and kind of this kind of stuff wasn't allowed in the 60s and certainly not before in Russia and the Eastern mm. Bloc because it was individualistic it was about drunks and outsiders and outcasts this you know this film was about uh, Jewish people and Jewish beliefs right so it's like mm. it's interesting that they these kind this, these kinds of stories started kind of pushing through a little bit you know compare it to like the very measured um structure of crystal we watched mm. you know it's a new sea where the bohemian guy in that is you know bohemian because he's a um you know a, a scientist <laughs> <laughs> but he chooses not to work in the city and he's like a, he's yeah. gone to the countryside you know that's the that's the kind of bohemian narrative in that uh whereas this is just like fucking balls to the wall um bizarre which a 40 of is as well um i should actually say um before i hand it back to you there's a really good documentary about a 40 of's um film made in poland uh in so the 90s. made a film of this of this novel no this it's it's not it's a documentary about it but it kind of stages uh. parts of the novel um uh, i know we always say this but i'll put it in the link description but um and it, we it's literally really, never really do and we were yeah, we never do <laughs> so i, um, just I so shared you know, it on twitter is. so i'll, re- I'll oh, repost okay, cool. it on the account i'm um, off social but, yeah. media so i don't know any i can't con- i can neither confirm nor deny any of this you're on the other shore so I mean that's I mean let's talk about Haas a bit more because yeah, you, yeah. we we we've talked about um, this mournful quality to it towards the end, but I think there's also a story here about you know shorn of its political and historical context as a, a story about father and sons, fathers and sons yes. here, isn't there? So what what do you think about that? That's a very quick and lazy way of me passing over, but <laughs> <laughs> it's so very, what it's, do you what say you? <laughs> it's very beautiful. I I personally mm. relate to it hugely. Um, the feeling of 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 dreaming dr- dreaming one's parents, I guess, is is the mm. feeling it gives off. He sees he's sort of frustrated by his father and confused and he's looking for um he's needing attention as well like I, the film really allows him to be a child in a very in a very simple way just wanting you know his father always seems to be preoccupied with other things and his father kind of towards the end of the film his father sort of they have a proper conversation and he but he's still sort of like rambling and, and there's this like, I mean, that just feels so, I can't even be critical about it. It just feels so true and so relatable. Mm. Like the, all every scene with his father, there's some kind of inability to connect. Yeah. Um, and yet some scenes, they get closer than others. And, you know, he's come here, just even the act of visiting the sanatorium is this act of, like, 
wanting to connect and then you have this his mother appears now and again she's obviously like a ghost but like yeah. she's there um she's re working through the kind of um yeah it's, it's sort of like she's unaware of him as an adult you know yeah her, so she just treats him like he's... a child and he's mm. sort of saying oh i'm an adult now but he at, at that point it's already slipping and sliding these kind of mm. realities i'm just so impressed by the ability of someone to play yes. with reality in that way and i just really sometimes i wonder because it's something you see quite a lot in polish cinema and i wonder like fuck like maybe it's just not in our um in our it dna in our culture as in england to to do to, to reach those levels of like of dream like what do you think doesn't do english cinema doesn't do the dream you know people but we still more dream. recently we still dream and it's, it's interesting but in the uk we've talked often about or alluded to like kitchen sink drama yeah um, but the, the kitchen sink drama or the ken loach approach ken loach approach um is is, the is often approach. the loach approach um worst part that could ever. be like the loach <laughs> yeah totally or like a radio five live talk radio program the loach yeah. approach um but with the, with that cinema you know the relationship between fathers and sons or families or communities is just a realistic bare bones depiction of that and the, the effect the effectiveness is to see it played out but um it kind of does it's a very grim cinema and it has no no room for 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 the nuances and complexities of like actual experience right um but um but with yeah with um sphere uh with uh <laughs> shout, um, out, shout out to shout out sphere just come in the room um um but yeah with 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 this uh particular film you know there's a celebration of the the psychological mysteries of of relationships you know and mm. I, I like that about it and it's not yeah it's not that english people don't have that quality it's just we don't have a kind of language or appetite to to watch that but not to say that they like you know has this film was uh, received in a lukewarm way i believe it wasn't uh massively uh, celebrated by critics for various reasons i think so it speaks oh yeah to it, an met, actual, it met, yeah. Met, met many ambivalent responses but it did it was sneaked mm. into can and it won the jury prize um but i guess i just on your point about like dreams i think that there is there is like a literalness in english culture mm. doesn't seem to happen so much in music i don't know i i'm always trying to create rules and f to, and like mm. reasons for like why this is just as an english filmmaker i feel i find myself frequently mm. like troubled by our relative inability to like grasp the cinematic and mm. i feel like i feel that for poles i mean first of all like there's a cinematic culture in poland where like you know to, to the best of my knowledge like pe young people in Poland know who Wojciech has is they know who mm. Kieslowski is they know who the great you know Andrzej Munk Vida you know all these people they know the names uh, whereas like yeah. here you know well you that, try, that's like, an education, try, like, asking education some young person about people like you know even even, even switched on people or, you know who, Clark, who, you know. who yeah they're like oh what I, th I think there's partly that's an educational thing because the Soviet education really was Cele celebrated um the arts even now in in the capitalist era the P the polish mm. people still celebrate their filmmakers oh totally i think i think it's you know like i said it, in in russia you know everyone the anecdote is always you know you ask anyone from like a, a fishmonger or uh, someone sweeping the streets to a university professor who their favorite novelist is and they'll they'll all have read Gogol and they'll all have read tolstoy you know and they and there'll mm. be there'll be an awareness everyone who knows who tarkovsky is and people celebrate you know um bulgakov uh there's you know moscow is full of graffiti to bulgakov uh the building that he uh lived in the whole stairwell public stairwell is full of graffiti to him and it's never been painted whereas if that happened in the uk it totally would have been painted over by the local council mm. people like who bulgarov what i think there's a there's a kind of <laughs> a way, appreciation for the arts which remains um you know it's even with the polish poster school which we talked about before you know polish posters stand out amongst any others for their quality and their 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 beauty um 
and there was an entire kind of department of university that was dedicated just to churning out po poster designers um, mm. and that's that's still very much a tradition today like people still consider themselves part of that polish school of posters and it's still really celebrated um, and yeah it's just a very different environment um, and a, a lot of that i think is to do with um, it's probably culturally specific but i think a lot of it's to do with soviet education um, I'm, and I'm somebody also who's Poland specifically because we often talk about Poland more than other countries in that region like yeah Poland is a country that has like for for various for several periods of time not existed it's a culture mm. that's like um between squeezed. cultures squeezed yeah it's in, in a sort of in a sort of a, uh, you know like a, a mid spot between like Russia the, the the monolith of Russia and like central europe and kind mm. of it's connected to the west it's in the european union um i feel like i feel like england yeah england we have a or britain england which is kind of the same thing you know if you know what i mean <laughs> you know what you mean shout out alex niven like I, like scotland scotland and wales are their own thing yep. but like england and britain are the same <laughs> yes <laughs> I know what you're saying, um, but it's there, true. Like, like I, I really sort of, feel like like Anglo Britishness is a thing. People in England think that think it's the same. It's just that you know, it's just that that's then that's mm. part of our like post our, like former colonial energy. But the but the point I'm trying to make is like there's a there's like a literalism and and probably an anti intellectualism as well. Totally, yeah. Which is kind of like. You know, like, it's interesting to me that, like, the best... To me, the best English filmmaker is Alan Clark. Mm. And Alan Clark is a filmmaker who makes work about people being totally unable to express anything. Like, Alan <laughs> Clark's films are, like, incredibly violent and brutal and harsh. Mm. And they are... They're, most of the benefit f of them is, like... Is the catharsis of seeing your own society like a mirror held up to your own society mm. um there are other filmmakers i like like i mean peter watkins i like for probably similar reasons because he's so yep. blunt um the game ken blunt. russell i like mm. because for different reasons because ken russell is like does have an element of that fantasy and that tenderness and that romance to him mm. um but generally speaking yeah i think that like there's something culturally for Poland and maybe specifically in Wojciech Kaz's case from coming from a Jewish Polish Jewish background um, about like about that ability to move between realities mm. well it seems kind of unique and I'm very enviable yeah you know? I'm very enviable I, I wish I knew more about it I mean I think uh, Poland has a, a kind of very unique streak about it in a lot of ways. Like I know we're talking, kind of reducing it to Soviet Union, but I know that's not true. I mean, you know, Poland has its own alphabet that it short, short, you know, it kind of rejected the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, it's Catholic rather than Orthodox. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of elements of Polish society that kind of, despite it being a squeezed a battleground between different power blocks, you know, it has kind of really had to kind of defend its its culture and its outlook and it has a very i mean having talked to polish people before they've lived with or kind of worked with ever um a lot of polish people i've known have got quite had quite a dark sense of humor um which in some ways is comparable to kind of like english sense of humor in some ways and there's obviously mm. there's obviously close parallels between there's a lot of affection and fondness well not in all quarters, but between Poles and English people or British people. Um, they're, oh, they're yeah, close we have a huge Polish population in this country. Huge, yeah, and have yeah. for a long, a long time. Um, and there's I a lot of fondness. Smith, one of the one of the Polish capitals of London. The Polish capital of London. I love it. <laughs> but that's it. Yeah, there's and everyone has. Everyone knows. You know the local po Polski sklep. You know the local shop. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, and so yeah, there's 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 interesting parallels, but then divergences. Like you said, the bluntness of Clark, or whatever, and it's the and I don't know what that comes down to. It, it, British culture is a lot more functional. Um, Huge obsession again, with status. Status, class, whereas Which doesn't that happen transcends. Yeah, whereas local identity and local, f I guess, like folk culture, because the UK does have that. And I think in music, it's more obvious because there are certain musicians who are kind of like Gazelle Twin or Richard Dawson, people who are kind of drawing on like the English weird in the English mm. eerie. And that's definitely really palpable in music, um, not so palpable in film. Um, 
and for me that's really interesting and i don't i don't know if that's uh the uk seems to value its documentary filmmakers a lot more maybe that's an influence of like john gris and bbc film unit documentary film unit and all that tradition but yeah it's uh we are bereft of dreams or people who can artifice dreams for us um we have kind of dreams being forced through banality i think that's maybe probably our like our greatest strength if you listen to richard dawson like 2020 like there's like the there's like magic creeping through the sort of banality of like mm. a, a job center or an amazon fulfillment center or you know mm. someone getting fish and chips take away social workers you know all those systems and stuff and then mm. like you know the music of burial which is like this totally. kind of but banal landscape of like raindrops and bus stops and ashtrays like with a bit of soul a bit of heartbreak like forcing its way through the you know. the, the, gro- the grotty the grottiness i think and and i think yeah i mean something like with now and i actually comes very close to a even though it's a very realistic film, there's a actually an absurdity to With No Lie, which mm. again, it's such an underrated film as part of like the English imagination, but I think it's really important and isn't given enough value as a serious film. It's treated as a cult comedy film, but I actually think there's an immense amount of like yearning and beauty in, in um, With No Lie, which actually is maybe a kind of bridge between what we've been talking about, actually, the, mm. the Haas and the Alan Clark. Um, you know, especially scenes like the end obviously where with Nell kind of addresses the camera directly and uh recites shakespeare um you know incredibly <laughs> bizarre with his umbrella and his gross coat and there and you know and he's actually sitting in the in the uh lion, not lion enclosure i can't remember what animal he sees it is a lion isn't it or a tiger haven't seen with now for years so I'm, yeah but there, you've there been is mentioning like a, it a lot recently so I'll i have you take the floor. It's such a foundational <laughs> film for me but there's there's that is one of the areas where the grogginess and the grogginess is embraced and the yeah, yeah but it's desire well. pushing through grogginess it's yeah the, the desire is there and you don't get that in nil by mouth you don't get that in in you know sort of keds or whatever like it's this <laughs> <laughs> it, you know this is there's this certain is kind cultural of, figures as well like like mm. pete like Russell Brand, you know, he's very much like desire mm. pushing through banality. Like um, P- Peter yeah. Cook, you know, the, the surrealism of Monty Python and Peter Cook. Like there, oh, definitely. there are lots of, Terry, lots Terry of Gilliam, ways in which know. this happens. Yeah, Ad- um, Adam Curtis, I think, is a really like he's, mm. his work is all about the sort of administration and systems, but like bubbling beneath it is this kind of like this more like cultural emotional feeling mm. one thing i would say about Haas, which you mentioned it, it, talking about desire it sec- sexually it's a very hungry film um it's it's very aren't we all in lockdown aren't we all it's very it's very get your tits out i think every female character in the film bar his mum uh is topless at one point um but i don't think it's in a, <laughs> i noted i noted that you just um, fucking backdailed the fuck out of that <laughs> film man like like what are you trying to say bro um well no i'm not it's no no condemning uh it's it's done in a very beautiful because obviously it's a child's desire and it's it's not exactly, like an obsession the with the, the vulva purest, it's an obsession with the breasts right it's a it's a yeah, yeah, i suppose yeah. freudian kind of thing a maternal thing um and these these characters are you know sort of yeah, it, it's a, it's a, it has like a maternal energy to it rather than a sexy energy. But there's an interesting bit where his father, the kind of more Freudian element of it is when his father's kind of uh, hosting a load of women uh, at a dinner and he's talking about this fillet of beef that he's had. Um, <laughs> and he kisses a boy on the mouth. And so it's this very erotically charged scene of his father as this, act, this kind of sexual figure. It's very, well, it's very Freudian, isn't it? Um, oh, yeah, moment. being sexually and, uh, intimidated by your father is... Father, is, yeah. Uh, all been there. Um, <laughs> um, but it does play with that stuff and it does play with kind of Freud I guess in a kind of um, subtle enough way I guess I don't know if it's in an yeah uh, but it doesn't like do Freud you know like the, no it doesn't like, no, people no, talk no, about no. Has being a like psychoanalytic film maker which I just mm. it just makes me cringe because it's like he's just yeah. talking about like relationships and life yeah, all, in, and, all and, it that, and, and a, he's talking about it with a certain truth that Freud's theory is mm. also it's a convergence rather than a copy. He's not of, trying. He's not. Freud. Yeah, he's not interpreting Freud. Like he'd, no, he's doing dreams. Like dreams. Ca- dreams happened before Freud talked about them. You yeah. Know? <laughs> um, I mean, that's it. Not. Yeah. Uh, believe it or not, but yeah, there it does have that uh, element to it. I think. Um, 
I was going to say right, maybe it's a bit more Jungian in a way, but whatever. Um, in terms of like a collective unconscious, it does feel more Jungian. Um, but there's some amazing moments of like collective coming together. Like when he's in at the beginning of the film, he's with a lot of el- elderly Jewish men, and they kind of begin to sing and dance. It's a really powerful mm. scene. Um, and at the, uh, to the begin hissets, with, yeah. Yeah, and to begin with, he's a kind of outsider to that. But then he kind of slowly picks up the moves and kind of mm, mutters the words. That's like a beautiful he's remembering moment. it. The it's really in. amazing. There's a lot of yeah. joining in. I mean, that's what's so graceful about it. I feel like mm. it wouldn't work in England because the character would be like, "What's all this then?" <laughs> <laughs> Keep it down. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, so it's true. Are trying to make a film here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally um, it is another amazing mystic, mystical quality it feels very emotionally open mm. yeah I love this film so much man I, I'm being very yeah. wary of reverence at the moment because mm. I think the more I watch films I love the harder it is to make films myself so yeah. and I, I, I I've got quite a lot of free time at the moment where I'd like to be being more creative so I'm going to try not to watch great films anymore I think that's they're, well, just, that's, they're a bit overwhelming that's your Tarkovsky, isn't it? It's, uh, I try not to make... I don't, if I find myself copying Bergman or I find myself copying a, film, a, a filmmaker I like in a, in a scene, I scrap it and turn away. You know, sort of, I, I feel like yeah. I want to make the films they make rather than copy the scenes they shoot. Um, but it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to kind of shed yourself of your influences. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, because everyone, every filmmaker has their own inner process. And I think, you know, as an artist... Um, if I may speak in my capacity as Ralph Pritchard, the artist, like I do this diary <laughs> film every year and it is probably the most, the best encapsulation of my inner process. And then most years I'll try and do some other things that are kind of a copying someone else's inner process. You know, I, I think mm. sometimes it's about like having the confidence to find your own process rather than like closing your eyes and imagining like, what Tarkovsky's eighth film would look like and try mm. and make that, you know. Yeah. Um, I think which is always your, tempting. It's always tempting. Um I, I think with your diary format, um, to make this very solipsistic, but your diary format is a uniquely Ralph Pritchard thing. Um Yeah, totally. You know? And it's like that's yeah, and that's a rich seam. Um I I, I the only thing that gets me through each year is waiting for Ralph's <laughs> diary. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. When will it drop? It used to be um, Charlie Brooker's year wipe before I realised it was really shit. And I was like, oh, that's, that's really funny, <laughs> funny, that thing. Because it used to be good. It used to be really good. And then yeah. the only good thing he really did was that. Um, like, that was that's his, his, his metier. That was him at his best. Um, but that was before the world went crazy, you know? Like, he's too much of a lib. Yeah. Charlie Brooker's oh, such he a really lib. Is. Really, he's such a libtard. To really um, cope with... Um, like actual the actual contradictions of capitalism coming to a head which oh, is what oh, we're oh, completely, yeah. through <laughs> yeah he, he, he was he was the fiddler while the world burns um but yeah um so shit that, that maybe that maybe that takes us to the end you know um <laughs> so whew, so yeah recommend fully uh even though there were moments where i thought there were moments where i think i wasn't enjoying it but because right. I guess You're it does. You're not all in the way I am. I'm not. I'm not. But I, there was so much love, and I love the vision. I love its des- openness of desire. I think. Yeah, there were certain bits where I, I felt like. I, I guess I was. It took me time to kind of see through its sillinesses. Um, mm. um, yeah, it's yeah. quite whimsical at times. It's yeah. very whimsical, and I like a bit whimsy, you know. But we'll see. These are serious times. Um, <laughs> yeah. What are we going to review next week? I don't know actually um nothing's been percolating i've been very oh i tell you what daniel Nefitu suggested ham on rye an american ham on film. rye i've seen this on movie Which is, yeah Not it's seen, actually on mo- seen it come up yeah it's movie. actually on movie so has it got anything to do that- with the uh, bukowski yes that's the title so. of a bukowski book i don't know if it's an adaptation yeah. of bukowski we'll definitely get cancelled for reviewing bukowski won't we i don't <laughs> even know if you bukowski. if you listen to his his tapes in his later years were amazing so he uh i can't remember who sat down with him but he recorded he did a lot of readings of his um poems and stories when he was much much older um and it's just recorded with an old kind of like 80s tape deck thing um 
and he just did them over a dinner table while he was like drinking himself to death but they're incredibly effective at the end of feet blackbird walks I'll dig it oh, out. Um, yeah, please send it to me. Okay, so next week moving. we're reviewing Ham on Rye. There we go. Decision made. If it turns out it's not a adaptation of Kowski, then, you know, whatever. This was still interesting inside. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, All that's right. it. Coming to you live from Hackney Wick and Wood Green. Wood Green. Oh, this you just doxed us. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to you live from... I'm doing a VPN in my brain. Um, Ipswich and Idaho. <laughs> Keep it real. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye bye.